Well, I hope that it's become apparent to the guys that I'm slowly whittling off all the things I don't like to do at the beginning of the ministry, in men's ministry, just to make sure we've gotten them out of the way, and then we can just do all that I want for the rest of the time that we're here. So we've done fishing, we've, we've done, done soccer. I know you guys are going to make me go to the beach at some point in time, and I just, I don't like the beach. The beach is just so bad. All the sand, my, my pale skin and the sun, they don't mix. My parents were vampires, in case you can't tell. I'm just, I'm so pale, the sun just, it eats me alive when we go out there. I just don't want to go to the beach at all. But especially, like, there's been so many shark sightings recently. Like, that's what people say all the time. It's just every day I turn on the news, another shark sighting, all this stuff. But I'm starting to become less concerned with shark sightings after I read a report that came out in 2015. In 2015, more people died taking selfies than they did from shark attacks. That's a fact, okay? Maybe I should give you pause next time you hold that phone up there to take a little bit of a selfie. More people died from taking selfies than they did from shark attacks in 2015. So those are just dangerous in and of themselves, right? If I could have a better chance of dying taking a selfie than a shark attack, then I, I should be very careful. But it's fine if you want to do that and put yourself at risk, that's okay. Uh, but a recent event that I saw uh, showed something happen a little bit different when somebody took a picture on their cell phone. It was something that was kind of tragically ironic. It was a picture of a girl that went viral, as the kids say, on the internet after they took it. Uh, she was on the beach. She was wearing a red sweatshirt that said lifeguard on it, and she was not a lifeguard. She's taking a, a picture, lifeguard, red sweatshirt, and in the back she was posing by the water, and she took a series of four different pictures. And in each one of the pictures, she is paying attention to making herself look the best for the camera, and then the first one you see a little child wander in the background. Then you move to the next one and the child's gone a little bit further into the break. Then you move to the third one and the child is almost fully immersed there. Then the fourth one, a parent running into the scene. She captioned that picture, saving lives. And the ironic twist of that is there possibly could have been someone with extreme danger in the background and she had no idea because she cared for herself. Now, to put you at ease, they found out afterwards that the child was okay. But still, think about that. A woman who would be so concerned and consumed with something going on to, to take a picture of herself, not even realizing that there's a child behind her, that she could help if it had gone bad. That tragic irony, I think, wraps up the book of Jonah so completely. Because if you think about what a prophet of God is supposed to do, a prophet of God is supposed to take the word of God to people and announce it to them so they can find salvation. And yet in picture after picture, in scene after scene, all we see is Jonah consumed with himself while there are people in the background dying. That is a tragic irony that we see in the book. But even with that tragic irony, and even with the relentless running that we saw from the prophet going away from God like we did last time, what we're going to see this time is that never stops God being in complete control of every situation. Turn with me to Jonah 1. We're going to find out how amazing this God is as he is in complete, relentless control, never losing his grip on the situation amidst the disobedience that this prophet shows him. Jonah chapter 1. We're going to take a look at verses 7 through 17 today. And amidst this tragic irony of a prophet who should be concerned with the salvation of others, God is still going to be in the business of saving people. And we'll find out who that is today. Jonah chapter 1 verse 7 says this, And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. The men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, 
for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. The continuing theme of the relentless running of the prophet who wants to run from his, his obligation to the God of the universe, who has charged him with a saving message to go to Nineveh and preach this gospel of repentance. This God, amidst all the disobedience and all the running that we see from the prophet, is still in control. And whenever we come to the Bible and we begin to see the way that it depicts God being in control of any and every circumstance, whether it be people, nation, events, God is in control of all of them. There is one response that we must have from that, and that is an attitude of worship. So let's put this down number one on our outlines. We need to be amazed at God's control. When we begin to be confronted with the God of the Bible, there is a humility that should come express itself in worship because we've come to know the one true God who amidst all things is always in control. And that's an incredible thing to think about. Do you remember even how last time, we just got a little preview of that, amidst the, the running of the prophet, the prophet is running in d- direct, defiant, flagrant disobedience to God. God says, go this way. Jonah runs the opposite direction. But what does God do? Hurls a storm at him, it says in Jonah 1.4. God in complete control of the weather takes it and says, oh, you want to run from me? I'm going to put this in your life so that you're unable to do so. We begin to see more and more the control of Jonah. But something happens in 1-7. Did you catch it? The, 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 the sailors are there and they're trying to figure out why is this storm coming upon us? So they say this phrase, let us cast lots. And there are moments in the Bible where I wish we could see like a meme of the person's face. You know, there's just those moments that show up in the Bible. You're like, I really want to see what was on their face. I want to know what was on Jonah's face when the sailors suggested casting lots. If you just write down Proverbs 16.33 for me, just write down Proverbs 16.33 and listen to this truth. Proverbs 16.33. It says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And if I know that about God, that any game of chance to just cast a lot and to find something, if I know that even God controls, every decision comes from that, what's Jonah thinking when these sailors suggest casting a lot? I think he knows it's going to fall on him, and that's exactly what happens Now, again, the sad reality that we're going to look at in a moment is it takes all of that focus to finally get Jonah just to say something. And he's not amazed at all by the control of God. But there's a few other elements in the text that I just want to highlight to show us that we should be amazed more and more by what God says. Did you catch the sailor's reaction in verse 14? What did they say? Cause us not to perish, O Lord. Lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And when you begin to say statements like that, it's when you begin to understand just how much control God has. When God can do whatever he pleases, and here these pagan sailors start to talk more like the psalmist who says, my God is in the heaven and he does whatever he pleases. When you begin to talk about God like that, you understand the control that he has. Whatever God wants to do, there will be no opposition to stop him. There is no rivalry against his power. And when he wants to get his man, he will always get him. And now these pagan sailors are starting to get that. You've done whatever you pleased. One final phrase, verse 17. The Lord appointed a great fish to go get Jonah. I was reading in one theological dictionary, it put it so good. It says this word for appointed expresses God's kingly dominion. And that's the right way to think about his control. Because he's the king overall and can do what he wants. He doesn't have to check with anybody. He doesn't need anyone's permission. He is the one who is king overall and able to appoint even a fish to come and to take Jonah. Now trust me, when we get into Jonah 2, the fish puns will be there, okay? But you have to wait for those when we get to Jonah 2 next time, okay? The fish puns will be just so abundant. But we're not going to do that now. 
but it does show and express God's complete control that as much as the prophet wants to run from God, he cannot do that. We need to be amazed by this God who can do all things, even amidst man's disobedience. And when you begin to understand that, now you see two things juxtaposed together that oftentimes people don't understand, but should cause you to be even more amazed by God. That amidst man's rebellious and wickedness, God is still in complete control. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. You just have to see this. And I, I know that you know the story, but now thinking about the amazing control that God has with Jonah, and now watch how he does it here in the story with Joseph. Turn to Genesis 45. Genesis 45. And just listen to these statements and stop for a moment and think about what they mean. And this is the God that you and I get to serve. Genesis 45. So you know the story, and if you're not familiar, let me just catch you up. Joseph, a man who was betrayed by his family, right? His family sells him into slavery. Then he gets sent to Potiphar's house. He does well against no bad motives of what he's doing. He gets lied by Potiphar's wife for trying to take advantage of her, and he gets sent to prison. In prison, he helps some people out, and they say they'll help him. They get out. They don't help him. So over and over again, Joseph has been mistreated. And evil, wicked things that men do seem to be winning against someone who's just trying to honor God. That is Joseph's heart. In fact, when Potiphar's wife comes at him, he says, how could I do this great evil and sin against God? Joseph loves God, but it seems like he's always losing and that God is not in control. But can you listen to Joseph's words in Genesis 45? Look at verse 4. Joseph's brothers, the ones who originally sold him, they come to him, and now he reveals himself. And he says this in Genesis 45, 4. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me here before you to preserve your life. For the famine has been in the land for these two years, and there were yet five years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to keep you alive for its many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. That is the God of the Bible. Amidst all the tragedy, all the calamity, all the wickedness, it does not matter what is brought against God as opposition. He takes the man, and when he wants to get in there, he will put him there. And when that moment comes and it's revealed that all that God is doing, you should simply step back and go, that is an incredible God. You know, there's, a, there's a director out there. Maybe you've heard of him. His name's Christopher Nolan. Some people like him, some people don't. I really enjoy him as a director. And you know what is so interesting? Every time I watch a movie of his, I watch a movie, and he's hired like some great actors who've won Academy Awards. But every time I watch a movie of his, I never once walk away talking about the actors in the movie. I talk about the story that the director told. Because he crafts such a masterful story that I didn't even see it coming, and then at the end, it hits. Maybe it's not Christopher Nolan for you. Maybe it's an author. Maybe it's a book you've read before. But it's that moment when everything just slides together. You begin to say, that author, that director, they're amazing. You should be like that with God every day. Every single aspect of your life is being woven together by a God who is who's so brilliant. And you serve that God. You should be amazed by him. The, the wickedness that went on could not stop his purposes. And flip over to chapter 50, verse 20, if you need more. This is a very familiar verse to all of us. Genesis 50, 20. The, jo the, the brothers see that their fathers died and they think, okay, Joseph's going to come get us now. And he said that they would even put that upon him. And in Genesis 50, 20, uh, Genesis 50, 19, Joseph says this, but Joseph said to them, do not fear for am I in the place of God? Which I think you can take that of two ways. One, he knows he's not the judge. I'm not in God's place. I'm not going to take what is not mine. I'm going to let God handle you the way that he's handled my life. I'm going to trust him that he will do what is right with you. But I also think that he's in the exact place that God wants him to be. The, the, the two double entendre aspect of that statement. But verse 20 says, As for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are 
today, do you see that even against the most wicked, rebellious, horrible actions, God is in control and he's doing so with a purpose. Ephesians 1.11, he's working all things according to the counsel of his will. He's weaving it and nothing is going to stop it. Not even wicked men who want to put a savior on the cross. Turn to Acts chapter 2. The reason why we need to be amazed at this is because this is the only reason we stand before a God forgiven because he can take wicked things and utilize them for an ultimate good so that we look to him and are amazed at all that he does. Acts chapter 2, take a look at verse 23. Let's start in 22 through 24. Acts 23. Acts 22, 2, 22 through 25, sorry. Acts 2, 22 through 25. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Do you understand just the amazing nature of that statement? The wicked, lawless actions of people who betrayed Jesus over and over again, they might be trying to oppose God's plan, but it does nothing but fulfill it. And he puts Jesus on the cross to die for your sins and rises him three days later so that when you put your faith and trust in him, death will have no dominion over you. And you will be saved in the presence of God. If you are not amazed by this God, you don't truly know him. We've got to have the right response. We've got to have the response of amazement. And we've got to let that carry out in our lives. Now listen, it's not just enough to know it. Do you remember what Jonah said back in Jonah? Jonah 1.9. Jonah goes, I serve the Lord. I fear him. He made the sea and everything in it. He's got intellectual knowledge of it, but doesn't follow it with the lifestyle. It's more and more about you taking something and not only contemplating it, but having it conduct yourself in a manner in accordance with the truth that you say you believe. Just write down Psalm 95. Psalm 95 is a picture of Israel, but it's also a picture of of Jonah. And what I find just so amazing, just take time later on today to read that psalm. The first six verses talk about God as being a great king. The, the, the depths of the earth of his, the heights of the heavens are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Then verse six says, oh come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are the people of the pasture, the sheep of of his hand, and the psalmist understands God is great. But you know what the next line is? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. It's possible to hear this amazing truth about God and harden your heart to it, to not be moved by it, to not think about it when you're going through a difficult time, to lean back more and more on the old things that you used to do than leaning towards the God who is in control of all things. Don't harden your heart to this truth. Be amazed by it. Respond appropriately to it. I was reading a book about the, uh, the war, um, 1776, the Revolutionary War, <clears throat> and uh, just an amazing time, account of George Washington and all that he thought um, that was going on. He wrote in his diary about a point where he just saw something outside of him really controlling everything. I want you to listen to what he said. He said this, It is not a little pleasing thing, nor less wonderful to contemplate that after two years of maneuvering and undergoing strange vicissitudes, that both armies have been brought back to the very point that they have set out from. This is what Washington says. The hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all of this that, there, that, <laughs> that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more than wicked that has not gratitude enough to acknowledge him in all his obligations. That's a pretty incredible statement. Now again, with the founding fathers, it, whether they believed in the God of the Bible or this hand of providence, it's a, up for debate. But he at least knows that there is something greater at work bringing all of these crazy things together and it would take somebody worse than an infidel to get to that point to see something in the hand of God being worked out 
at not being grateful, not being thankful, not being amazing. I've seen that in my own life. I remember in college, okay? I just remember, it always has to do with a girl in college, okay? I remember in college, I was driving back home. I think it was uh, Thanksgiving break. It was Thanksgiving or Christmas, probably Christmas. Yeah, Christmas break. I was driving back home. And it just, we had just broken up with, I'd just broken up with a girl. Who's we? I, I had just broken up with a girl. <laughs> I had just broken up with a girl. And you know, like, I, I went to school in Virginia, and that's a 12-hour alone car ride by yourself. So you can just imagine, I'm belting out Casey and JoJo with all my heart <laughs> in the midst of this Buick Century, just devastated that all that had gone on. And man, I just, driving home was hard, but then I got home and it was nice to be with family. There's another 12-hour ride back, and I'm thinking, God, I just, this is the worst situation. I thought everything was going to work out with this one. And I pull up, I get back early, three days early. I still can't remember why. Why was I back three days early? I go to a church that I didn't normally go to. I heard a pastor that I don't normally listen to. And at that point in time, he opens up the Bible and begins to talk about the control of God in all circumstances. And amidst my pain, I'm like, wow, that's really true. And God just began to weave that together. It would take another two years till my wife and I met. But God was just so incredible in that time during pain and difficulties and all those different things to just weave it together to have my wife and I meet in California when we're both from the Midwest in the same church of 8,000 people to find one another. If I can't look back at God and say, God, you are incredible. I'm missing something. He's always at work amidst the, the hardest times, and he's going to get us there. He's made the promises to do so. He will be faithful. But are you amazed by it, and do you respond appropriately? How do you respond appropriately? Well, it's with worship, but I think a specific kind of worship. Did you catch it in the text twice? It's described as the fear of the Lord. Let's put that on number two. We must fear God. If we are amazed at what he does, the response in us should be the fear of God, which is so misspoken of today and so misunderstood that it's, it's a sad reality because the fear of the Lord is such a good thing. But did you catch it? That's why the author of Jonah, who I take to be Jonah, is such a wise author. He has put two different groups of people up to one another. He has described Jonah, or accurately, Jonah has described himself as someone who fears God. And then he takes the sailors, these pagan sailors who were polytheistic people, and he puts them up as the end as the group of people who fears God. So now what the author is getting you to do is to say, who genuinely fears God. One person describes himself as doing it. Somebody else describes the other person as doing it. I think it'd be good for us to, to take a look at who really fears God in the situation. And to do so, we need to figure out what the fear of God looks like. Turn with me to Deuteronomy. Let's just describe this. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy, if you ever want to understand the fear of the Lord, is a great book to just understand fear, the fear of God. Deuteronomy 31. We're going to take a look at verses 9 through 11. Deuteronomy 31, verses 9 through 11. And this is a theme that you'll see all throughout the book of Deuteronomy and the Old Testament. We'll just hit a couple verses here. Deuteronomy 31, 9 through 11. Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and their little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord God and be careful to do all the words of this law." So you start to understand that what it means when I say I really fear God, it is responding appropriately in obedience to his word. Now here's where the misunderstanding comes. Some people think that you're trying to promote some sort of legalistic attaining of your salvation when you say that. 
But nothing could be further from the truth when you come to understand what we just spoke of, that God made his relationship with you possible simply because of his grace. And now that you are in that relationship, fearing him helps you keep his word. It's all about your response to the word of God. Please write down Psalm 112, 1. Psalm 112, 1. It says this, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, the next line, who greatly delights in his commandments. That's what it means to fear God. I now look at commandments and I don't keep them because if I hedge my bets enough with God, I am going to be able to persuade God with my good deeds to let me into heaven. That's not what we're talking about. What we are saying is the king of the universe who orchestrates everything together, who knows what is best for us at the exact moment we need it, has given us commands so that we don't have to falter when times are hard, so that we're not tricked into temptation into hurting ourselves. You get to fear God and keep his commandments. I was just challenged by this the other day. I'm trying to work my way back through Philippians. We looked at that when we first planted the church trying to put it on my heart and my mind. And we get to Philippians 2, and I'm just looking at it so differently now, and in such a better way, I think. I look at it, and when he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing, instead of looking at that and saying, oh, that's a command that I have to keep, I realize God loves me enough to tell me that amidst all bad circumstances, stop complaining and make sure you do what I'm asking you to do because that's where you find peace and joy and love. That's how you look at the commands of a loving father who gives it to you as an opportunity for obedience and blessing, not as a legalistic means to keep it. And I know that that is true because there's a God behind that commandment. That when I do all things without grumbling or disputing and I stop complaining, that same God who's in control of all things is going to bless me the way that the, pro- the Bible promises he will bless me. You see, I've been seeing these things go around on Facebook recently and this is not directed at anyone. If this was put on your Facebook profile, I don't think that it was anyone here. I can't remember who put it on there. But somebody put this, it was just one of those memes out there. And it was like it was this, you know, fantastic, brilliant thing that had just been created. It says this, Stop complaining for a day and see if your life doesn't change or something like that. And it's just put out there and people are posting it on their walls. It's not bad to post that there. But think about this. Is that some brand new revelation? It's not. These people didn't create that. God created that. And he did it for your good. And yet we're so biblically illiterate that we would look at posts like that and go, oh yeah, I need to do that. Rather than when God speaks to you. Take that to heart for a moment because we're talking about fearing God and responding to his word. It means something because God said it. Not just because it's a Facebook post. <laughs> you could even, my son Trenton, okay? You guys know my son Trenton? He, he, he's not helpful in stopping people from complaining, okay? We have, it's just, he's just the cutest kid. We have other kids, and I won't tell you which one's complaining, but we're, we're dealing with complaining in the household. And we will always say this, Okay? Somebody will complain and we'll just, as parents say, hey, stop complaining. And every time we say it, you can go ask my wife or you can go ask Trenton. We say, hey, stop complaining. And Trenton will go, stop complaining and start Swiffering. (laughs) Which the tagline for Swiffers is stop cleaning and start Swiffering. But every time we say that, Trenton will say, stop complaining, start Swiffering. And I'm like, Trenton, you are not helping, buddy. Okay? There is no promise there. That's not a help. You're not helping me to direct your brother's heart towards God right now. God did that. God said, stop complaining, okay? Because it's bad for you to do so. Because complaining means you think you have control or a better plan for the way the universe should go. And guess what? You don't. You are not God. And you don't see everything the way he does. And you're not moving it towards his glory. Chances are you're probably moving it towards your own. And God will not have that. God is moving everything for his glory. And when that happens, it's for our greatest good. Man, when you stop complaining and do what God is, you're you're fearing God and you're delighting in his commandments. I'm doing this because God said so. And I love God. That's appropriate fear. So would that describe Jonah? I mean, Jonah chapter one, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, go do this, and he goes and does the direct opposite, okay? 
So now let's pull back for a moment and again ask the question we asked last week. What has God said to you that you stand up and say, oh, of course, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I fear God. What has he told you to do? And you are doing the exact opposite of it. Because that is such flagrant disobedience. Titus describes those people this way. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good works. That's not Pastor Elliot's description. That is Paul's letter to Titus describing people who would say, I do fear God, but I'm doing the flagrant disobedience in his face. Those things don't go together. Now, that doesn't mean that you're a perfect person, okay? But if I have a fear of God, when that disobedience comes in my life, that's what I deal with right away. I'm not going after that disobedience anymore. I'm making changes. I'm getting help. I'm going to the word. But just to flagrantly do it over and over again and I claim to fear God, that's, that's what Jonah did and he didn't know God. Again, this is a picture of someone pre-salvation. The entire book of Jonah is that. We're going to see this is what it means not to repent. And Jonah's doing that each and every week. We're told to do this, ran from God. What else? What does God tell you? Go back to Jonah. What does God say the two greatest commands are? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, which means you should care for other people just as much as you care for yourself. Ask yourself this question, did Jonah do that? Commandment of God, does he care for other people more than themselves? No. He's on a boat and the storm is raging and it's going to kill these men and he won't say anything until they cast lots to point at him. He's so selfish. That's almost exactly what happened to Achan in Joshua 7. Do you remember that story? You should check it out later on because it's very similar to what's going on here. There's a hardness of heart in Achan and he hides this disobedience underneath his tent and it causes other people to die and yet he won't do it and he won't confess until lots are cast and it points to him. Don't say you fear God if you're not willing to respond to his word. That's exactly what's going on here. What else happens with Jonah? Don't be fooled in verse 11 when it says, the sailors come to him and say, what shall we do? And he says, throw me overboard because I know it's me, right? I was actually reading one of the commentators who I respect, who I think is a brilliant man, start to say, hey, look at the change Jonah's making. It's absolutely not true that he's changing right here. You know what? That would be a good thing if God told him to do that, right? Did I miss that in the text? Did God say, hey, Jonah, throw yourself into the ocean and make sure that you do that so that the storm will stop and you protect people. Then we could say that's a noble thing because he's responding to God's word. Where in the text did Jonah get this? From his own heart. What I think this is revealing is that Jonah would rather die than be obedient to God. Throw me into the ocean. I, I know what would stop the storm, and you know how we know that? Because in chapter 3, when he goes and preaches, hey, calamity's coming upon you, Nineveh, and the only way to stop it is to repent, Jonah knows I need to repent right now. I need to say to God, I'm sorry for fleeing. I need to go back and do what you've called me to do. That's exactly what should be going on here. You say, throw me overboard, I'd rather die. He doesn't know if that's going to change it. He just knows that's going to stop him from doing what God's asking him to do. Jonah, he doesn't care about anybody but himself. And he'd rather die than be obedient to God. So I don't think he's the one who fears God. But did you check the response of the sailors? Incredible. Pagan sailors who start out polytheistic, but at least when they see the storm, they're sensitive to know this is coming from a divine presence. This is not like any storm we've seen. The, the, the pagan captain comes to him, Jonah, and says, perhaps maybe if you call out to your God, he'll, he'll relent of this. That's starting the process of repentance. In fact, that word perhaps shows up seven other times in the different prophets to say, perhaps if you repent, God's going to relent of the calamity. It's drawing people to repentance. God's even using a pagan captain to get him to think, oh yeah, if I, if, I, if I repent, perhaps God will do that. By the way, that's the right posture to go to God. God doesn't owe you forgiveness. When you go to him and you say, perhaps you would be merciful to me, you are, are, are ascribing to him the control he has of like, oh yeah, king of the universe, I don't have to forgive you. I don't owe you this. We come to God and we think he owes us things. It's exactly the way Jonah lived, but perhaps... God, you'd be so kind. You know what the promise of the Bible is? He is. Jonah 4, we're going to learn. He's compassionate, gracious, loving, forgiving. And because he's that God, he will forgive. Now these pagan sailors begin to see that. 
And even when Jonah instructs them to throw him into the water, they refuse to do that, but they try to help Jonah out. You see that, that, t- that text in the phrase? Instead of doing that, they began to row harder to try to get him back to the land. What a kind thing to do. You know what? If Jonah would have said, hey guys, uh, I'm the cause of the storm, throw me into the water, uh, I would have tied a rope around him so I could throw him in once, pull him back in, and throw him in twice, okay? I, you wouldn't need to tell me, throw Jonah into the water. I would have done it because he's the cause and he brought it on the people and it's his fault. But these sailors are now trying to take him back to land amidst this great storm that's caring for other people. And finally, what does it say? When they go to God and they're going to throw him overboard because they see no other option, they beg to God for mercy. Please don't hold this against us, God. This, this, this person, please don't hold this against us because you do whatever you please. We understand who you are in complete control of all things. These sailors have repented. They fear God, as the text says. They greatly feared the Lord, and they made offerings of sacrifice and vows. See, that's a life that's now directed and oriented towards God. When you see phrases like making vows and sacrifices in the Old Testament, there's a good way to do it and a bad way to do it. Israel always did the bad way, right? They would make a sacrifice, but it would just purely be the ritual to do it. But here, this is showing that when the heart is behind it, when the true heart of worship and the fear of God is behind it, when I make a a sacrifice and an offering, then God accepts those things. You go to the New Testament, Romans 12, that's why we're called to offer up our lives as living sacrifices. Or Hebrews 13, 15, offer up sacrifices of praise to God from the fruit of your lips. We're called to make this complete sacrifice to the God in control of all things. That's what it means to fear him. We've now seen that in the lives of these sailors. It's so incredible to think that way. Now, with this, I think we have to say, it's the sailors who fear God, not Jonah. He finds himself in the water, running from God, but God appoints the fish to swallow him up. What an incredible thing. God's still in control against the disobedience of this prophet. That's a God to be feared. Psalm 111 verse 10 says this, All who practice the fear of the Lord will be blessed. It's something you can put into practice. It's something you live out. It's a a worldview that you have. You make every decision based on the God who's in control of all things. And now out of fearful love and awe and reverence to him, I'm going to do what he tells me to do, even when situations are hard. This is what it means to fear God. And when you're driven by that fear amidst anything, you can survive. See, uh, I heard a story recently of the first female team that was going to make the trek to the North Pole. They did it as a series of relays. They they took these people who were not trained athletes, they were not hikers, they were not anything, and they put out an ad, and for a couple years they were going to train them over and over again to make sure that these women would be able to make it all the way through. One of the women, her name was Ann Daniels, uh, was a a mother of triplets, okay? So we know she's tough right away, right? She's a mother of triplets right there. But she she would go through the training and she'd go back and forth and they got to the time where they were actually going to march to the North Pole. And so they started marching to the North Pole and as you can imagine, like it was very tumultuous. Like bad things happen, people start falling in cracks. She falls into the crack of water. She's freezing, they get her out, they, they help her, they help her move on. And she started to talk about the process of just continuing on after all of these hard things. And what happened at that point in time is she began to say, I just, everything in me wanted to just sit down and not move forward. But she said this, I kept saying to myself, I feared the re- missing the relationship of my three babies. Everything in her screamed, just sit down and give up. But the fear of losing the relationship of those three kids, she said she literally would just chant over and over again in her mind, Lucy, Joseph, Rachel, Lucy, Joseph, Rachel, to get her to go to that next step because that relationship and the fear of losing it drove her forward. I think there's good parallels to that in the Christian life. There are times where you just feel like you just want to stop and give up. But based on your fearful relationship with Yahweh, with the God of the universe, you've got to push through anything. And when you know that he will sustain you through it, anything becomes possible because you know that your God will work out all things for good, according to the counsel of his will, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. See, that's the amazing God you serve. That's the God that these pagan sailors serve. 
And it's the God that Jonah's running from. Don't be him. Be the sailors. Repent, fear, and live to honor God the rest of your life. Let's go to him and ask that he'd help us to do so. God, you've been so good to provide for us just this glimpse of what it means to dishonor a God who is so loving and caring and kind and faithful and powerful. God, we, we see that every day and you weave all these amazing circumstances into our lives. And yet, Father, we would just chalk it up to luck or chalk it up to, to good circumstances. God, you are so in control. We, we praise you for that. God, may we be amazed by that and may that cause us to say, no matter what happens, I should always fear you and do what your word tells us to do because that is the best thing for me. And when I fear you, Father, I have no other fears to drive me. God, may we learn from the negative example of Joseph, but may we follow the sailors who would consecrate themselves by giving these sacrifice and vows to say, you are the God of the universe. I'm not gonna harden my heart towards you. I'm gonna do what you asked me to do. And when we do that, Father, we, we honor you and we give you the glory you deserve. So we ask that you would do that good work in us here. Ask that you would give us the mind to go out and share the gospel to people who are running from you. And God, I beg that that, that gospel would save them because it is the power of God unto salvation. So God, would you do that in our lives and would you do that in the lives of the people that we, we go out and minister to? All for your honor and glory and all by your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.